OK. So I think we're live now. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Shai Moran um, from IAS, who's going to give the talk today. So before um, moving on to Shai, let me introduce everyone who's joining us uh, today. So it's nice to have a large number of uh, groups. So first, I'll start with uh, André from uh, MPII. Uh, welcome, guys. Um, then we have um, Benjamin um, from, um, sorry, I lost track here, uh, UW, uh, University of Washington uh, at, at UW, sorry, Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, welcome, Benjamin. Uh, then there's uh, Clément with a group from Stanford. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, then there's Erfan uh, from Indiana University. Uh, welcome. Uh, Fang Yi just joined us uh, from University of uh, Michigan. Uh, hi, Fang. Uh, then there's uh, Janish with a group from Caltech. Uh, welcome. And then uh, Zhang Qiang uh, is joining us from Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, welcome. And finally, uh, we have a group led by Nishant from University of uh, Victoria. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, all right. So it's a pleasure uh, to have Shai. So before we start, let me uh, thank everyone who's working uh, for TCS Plus uh, behind the scenes. So that's uh, Ilya Rajenstein, uh, Clement Canon, who's here, Anindya Day, uh, and Odette Regev, uh, who are doing um, all the legwork. Uh, let me also announce um, that the next talk, a couple of weeks from now, will be given by Danupon Nanongkai from uh, KTH. And then two weeks after that will be Michael Kearns from uh, University of Pennsylvania. So, but uh, today, um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Shai Moran from IAS. Uh, so Shai got his uh, PhD in 2016 from Technion, uh, advised by Amir Yehudayov. And then he spent a year uh, in California in between UCSD and the Simons Institute at UCSD. He was um, uh, working with Shahar Lovet, uh, and uh, now he's a uh, postdoctoral scholar at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So Shai has done an um, impressive amount of work in uh, statistical learning theory and more generally complexity theory. And so today he's going to tell us about uh, some joint work with um, joint work with Kane. Sorry, um, 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 Daniel Kane, Shahar Lovet, and Jiapeng uh, Sang. So um, welcome, Shai. It's a pleasure to um, have you as our speaker today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a small correction: uh, Amir Spilka was also uh, my advisor for my PhD. He should oh. get the credit. He was uh, a, good, uh, a good, a good, a uh, good. He should get the credit for that. Yeah, he suffered me for many, three years or four years. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. It's really uh, a great honor, and um, I hope I will be able to live up to the standards of these uh, great talks that uh, you host. Okay, so let uh, shall we begin with the talk? I assume yes. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So yeah. So I'll talk today about two um, two related projects, and uh, the common theme uh, they share is that uh, they are both about uh, comparison. So they both manifest uh, the strength of comparison queries. So comparisons is maybe one of the most basic tools, algorithmic tool that we know. You know, from the very early days of computer science. Uh, sorting algorithms and many data structures and uh, yes yeah, so today we'll discuss uh, two more manifestations of their potential uh, power so the first uh, talk will be the first part will be about uh, machine learning about interactive learning and this is a joint work with uh, uh, Daniel Shachar and uh, Jia Peng from UCSD so what is active learning? Yeah, so it's going to be completely self-contained. You don't need to know anything about, uh, uh, about machine learning. Everything will be explained. So what is active learning? So in standard uh, passive or supervised learning, we're given a bunch of labeled examples, and we need to learn some unknown concept. In active learning, we assume that we are given unlabeled examples. We will soon see examples. We will soon see some examples for this. And we need to query the labels of hopefully few points and still predict as well as if we would have got all labels. So this is useful when unlabeled data is cheap, but labeling it is costly. So for example, you need to, uh, in the context of medical uh, 
uh, of, of medicine, you may need to query a doctor to, to ask whether this data indicates some disease or not. So the question is, when is it possible? So let's consider just to, um, to get used to it, a very simple example. So let's assume we, there is some unknown threshold in one dimension that labels all the data. And what we are given are endpoints, these black points that you see on the bottom. We do not see their labels. Some of them are minus and some of them are plus according to this unknown threshold. So there is some point T until, we, until T everything is minus and from T onwards everything is plus. And our goal is to make as few label queries as possible. So in each, in each round we can pick a black point and ask what is the label of this point. And the goal is to make as few queries as possible to be able to infer the labels of all endpoints. So as probably uh, you can already see, um, one way to do it is using binary search. What does it mean? So at first we get these n unlabeled points. We will query the middle point. We see that it's positive. Once we see it's positive, we can infer that everything to the right of it is also positive. And then in each iteration, we go to the half of the unknown interval, we query the middle point, and we infer at least half of the remaining points. So after a total number of log n rounds or log n queries, we infer all n labels. So this is one example where, you know, with, uh, even if you get unlabeled input, you can still make few queries and uh, exponentially less than, than the number of labels you have. Unfortunately, um, this phenomena where you have such strong algorithms is not does not hold in general. So even for very simple function classes, it does not hold. So let's see an example, the two dimensional uh, thresholds. So what are two dimensional thresholds? So now again, we are given unlabeled points in the plane. We have n points in the plane. There is some hidden line that everything to the left of this line is labeled say positively and everything to the right of this line is labeled negatively. We don't know this line we just get the input points, the n input points unlabeled. And our goal is again to make as few label, as few queries as possible to be able to correctly infer all possible labels. Uh, and now we, I hope we will convince you that any algorithm must query essentially all uh, labels. Now, why is that? The reason is that you can find n points in the plane that are in convex position. So you can take them on a, on, a, on a circle, for instance. What does it mean that they're in convex position? It means that every point can be separated from the rest of the points by some line. So as you can see, if the points are on a circle, this is indeed possible. Now think of the following adversarial argument. The adversary will always answer you red. Whenever you query a point, whether it's red or blue, it he will tell you it's red. And as long as you didn't query at least two points, there are two consistent um, continuations of this labeling. One when the one point is separated, it's blue, and one when the other point is blue. So uh, you will have to ask any algorithm will have to query basically all points. Okay, so um, this is, um, this is somewhat disappointing because uh, still in, uh, in, in machine learning, there is a lot of research in active learning. And um, yeah, so, so what, what can we do next? So one, one, one direction is to assume that the data is nice. So these kind of examples are not, uh, are not possible. But another, uh, another uh, direction that is actually also practically relevant is to allow additional queries. So what do we mean by allowing additional queries? So remember that we have a domain expert, the one that gives us the label, and we have the algorithm that can query the labels in each iteration. So instead of just being able to ask whether the point is red or blue, we want to give, it, to give the algorithm more, more possibilities. Now, of course, the, the important question is which additional queries 
may we allow? And of course, this is problem dependent. So you can consider a very strong model where any yes, no query is possible. And, you, and indeed, this was considered in the 90s. But you can show that this, uh, that from a practical perspective, this is useless because most of yes, no questions that the algorithm will ask will be meaningless uh, in many contexts. So without getting into too many details about that, we need to somehow restrict the queries. Um, and one, one uh, direction that, uh, that uh, seems to be successful in practice is to enable relative queries. Now, what are relative queries? So I, I will not define it formally. I don't think there is even a formal definition. But let us see just two examples. So this is one relative query. You can ask which of two restaurants, Japanese or McDonald's, is better. OK? You query relative information. Or you can take three objects and ask, is object A is more like object B or more like object C? This is another example of a relative query. And, uh, and you know, practical uh, algorithms, in practice, it shows that, you know, that human annotators are able to deal with such queries um, and to provide meaningful answers that accelerate the learning process. So going back to the formal uh, world, what we consider is uh, perhaps what is the most basic relative query. So let me formally define what I mean by this. So we assume that the class of functions from which the adversary uh, that, that labels the, the points is a class of Boolean function, H, capital H. But every Boolean function there is, in fact, the sign applied on some G, which is a real function. So for example, when, when capital F, when the underlying class of real function is the class of all linear functions from RD to R, we get that H is the class of all half spaces. And there are many function classes in learning that are of this type, for which there is some underlying class of real functions, on top of which we take sign. Neural nets are examples also, you know, polynomial uh, signs of poly polynomial threshold functions, etc. Now, what kind of queries do the, do the learner get to ask? So as before, uh, the algorithm can ask a label query. It can pick an input point, an unlabeled input point, and ask what is the lab what is the label of this input point, which is which corresponds to sign of G applied on the input point. The novel uh, type of, the, the novel type of queries we allow are comparison queries. So the learner can also ask whether to pick two input points and ask is G of X I is larger than or equal than G of X J. Okay, so these are the kind of queries the algorithm is allowed to ask. The goal is the same like before, to reveal all labels, but the learner has no power and can get to ask these comparison queries. Okay, so let us consider a very uh, simple example that hopefully will help us di digest it. So let's go back to the case of two-dimensional thresholds, half planes. So what is the crucial observation here? So there is a very nice interpretation of a comparison query. So let's say we already queried two negative points, and we know that the label is negative. And now we take a comparison query. So I claim that, let's say, uh, one negative point, or if you have two points of the same label, then the comparison query exactly corresponds to comparing the distance from the separating line. OK, if this is not clear, then please uh, shout at me. Um, OK, so in this context, the game is as follows. We get an endpoints uh, in the plane. There is some hidden line that separates the point to two sets. And what we can do in each step is either label whether a point is on the positive side or on the negative side, or we can take two points and compare which one is closer 
to the separating line. This is the game. Now I claim that now we, we can uh, we can remedy the, the previous situation in which we acquired endpoints. So let me elaborate on what the algorithm is. Um, are there any questions about um, the problem we are going to to solve? Yeah, I have just one question. I was going to ask it later, but um, I, I'm just wondering about this. So is it going to make a big difference if you actually reveal g of x instead of uh, the, the value of g of x instead of um, just whether it's bigger than you know g of y or something? Yeah, so if you reveal g of x, so this is an example for a non-relative query, which is for, for practical reasons, it's a, it seems to be useless. So, so right. revealing g of x gives you the value, right? Like the value yeah. of the linear function in position x. And this is a lot of information. And I guess with, yeah. with such queries, you just need, I guess, d plus y, you know, three queries or two queries to, to interpolate, right? If you have a linear function, oh, it, I see. it, it makes the problem kind That's of true. trivial. Okay, but thanks. also practically, it's like, you know, like let's say I want to, the learning problem is to predict which restaurants you like or dislike. So it makes sense to ask you whether you like McDonald's more than Burger King, but it makes less sense to to ask whether you like McDo whether you know like to assign a, an absolute value to how much you like McDonald's. So these kind of queries are also practically more difficult to answer. To give like absolute values, real values to it's easier to compare two things than uh, assigning absolute values. Okay. Right. I mean, there's no. Um, okay. Thanks. Canonical scale. Okay, so going back to the problem we're going to solve, so we get n, um, we get n input points like this, black input points. There is the unknown line. We don't know it. Our goal is to make as few queries, either comparison queries or label queries, as possible, and to reveal all possible labels. So how how does the algorithm work in this case? So in each step, we sample. Uh, 10 black points, 10 unknown points that we don't know their labels. We label all of them. So we know that, let's say, these uh, are blue and these are black and these are red. OK, so we spend 10 queries just to label all of them. And then using comparison queries, we find in each class, in the blue class and in the red class, we find the point that is closest to the separating line. So this is just like finding a minimum in an array of, you know, at most 10 points, two minimums. Okay, so using comparison queries, we find the point that is closest to the separating line. And now the, the observation is that if we build these cones, so what, what are these cones? So we know that the point that is closest to the separating line we lie on the, let's say the blue point, we lie on the convex hull of the blue point. So we take both neighbors on the, on the boundary of the convex hull, and we consider this cone, this, this intersection of two half, half planes that is um, uh, at this point. So I claim that every point in the blue cone has to be labeled minus, and every point in the red uh, cone has to be labeled plus, and this is just because we know the, the, the cone is, the, the apex of the cone is on the nearest, uh, on the nearest uh, point to the line. Okay, so how do we proceed? All points that are inside this region, inside this inferred region, uh, we, can, we know their labels, we know that they are blue, so we can get rid of them. And then we repeat this process on the unlabeled points. So again, we are going to sample some uh, S of size 10, we're going to find the two nearest points, label, uh, you know, label them, uh, compare, find the minimum, build the cones, infer, and go on. So obviously, we repeat as long as uh, there is uh, some point that is unlabeled. So at the end of the day, we will have all points labeled. And the question is, how many rounds will it take? So uh, as we will later see. The crucial lemma is that in each round, we infer one half of the unlabeled points that remain. Okay, this is what we're going to show later, 
or to discuss later. So on expectation over the sampling of 10 points, in each round, one half of the remaining points is being labeled. So this gives us a bound on the expected number of queries. So in each iteration, we, you know, we query 20, 20 queries. We have log n rounds on expectation. So the, the expected number of queries is 20 log n. OK, so is this example clear? I, now I want to move to describe the more general results. And um, so if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I'll give you. So I've got a stupid question. Is there any meaning to the constant to the constant 10 or? It's a very good question. The constant 10 uh, is, um, is a kind of, uh, you can think of it as a combinatorial parameter that is assigned to the class of all half planes just like the VC dimension of half planes is whatever, three. So it's another kind of combinatorial dimension that we introduce, and we will discuss it in more detail later. So 10 is some kind of dimension that is assigned to each uh, set class of uh, Boolean functions, or, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great, so let's... Uh, so let me now uh, discuss some of the more general results we have in this context. So yeah, what we focus is on the class of half spaces. So we just uh, saw the two dimensional case. What can be said about three dimensions? So unfortunately, the first news I'm going to bring you uh, are bad news. So there are sets of endpoints in R3 that require at least um, omega of n uh, label and comparison queries. So just like in the plane, we had a counter example, you know, in, on the line we did log n with label queries, and in the plane we had this uh, difficult example. Similarly, if we go to R3, we have a difficult example for, uh, for comparison and label queries. And I think already here there is an interesting uh, kind of semi-formal open question is um, so notice that on the one in the one dimensional case we could do very well just with label queries, and then this failed in two dimensions. But in two dimensions, once we introduced comparison queries, which query two points, not just one, they, they, it's some information about two points, then we could do well in two dimensions. But this is again failed in three dimensions, and my question is. Is there like a three dimension, uh, you know, a three query, like comparing three, three points, like a three wise comparison in some sense that will allow you to, again, to fix the, to remedy the three dimensional case, to do log n for three dimensions. And maybe you get a hierarchy. So you have some three, three way comparisons that saves the, the, you know, you know, get this exponential speed up in, in the, in the 3D space, but then it does not work for R4, and then you need like a four-dimensional query, or four, um, so maybe it will be like an interesting hierarchy like that. Okay, but that's just um, uh, a small detour. So while there are examples like that that require, that require um, many queries, these point sets are exotic. And what I really mean by that is that we can do much better if we assume that the data is well-behaved. So let me be more uh, uh, precise. So in particular, if we have bounded bit complexity or large margin, then we can do much better. And more formally, so assume now that each of the unlabeled points is on the, on the integer grid and that the norm of this point is not too large. So let's say, you know, the L infinity norm is at most capital B. Okay, each point is in the, this uh, uh, d-dimensional cube uh, or uh, d-dimensional grid. So then uh, we can still, we have a similar phenomenon like in the plane. We can still do in order of log n queries. We reveal all n labels, but, and, and the constant before log n is roughly d log b. Okay, so d log b is roughly the description length 
of each point. So for example, if we just work with bit strings, so b equals one, so we have, a, we have our points come, come from the Boolean cube, then we get something like d log n, the dimension times log n. Okay? And uh, just as a, as, a, as a toy example, imagine that uh, the unlabeled points are all possible points in the Boolean cube 0, 1 to the d. Then basically what it so n in this case equals 2 to the d, you have all possible 0, 1 points in, uh, in Rd. So basically what it says is that all the labels, all 2 to the d labels can be determined using just d squared comparison or label queries. So you reveal 2 to the n labels using just d squared um, requests from, from, the, from the function queries. Okay, so this is the first uh, positive result. If the bit complexity is bounded, then we can uh, retain the logarithmic uh, dependency. The margin-based bound is that, uh, so what is the margin? So here we assume that basically the, the convex hull of the positive points and the convex hull of the negative points are far away from each other. So there is a, so that's what margin means. And here also we can get a, a very good behavior. So we get d log one over the margin times log n. And for those of you who do optimization, you can identify this d log one over gamma from, um, from inner point methods like ellipsoid or radial cutting plane. Um, and another remark is that we cannot get in, so there is a dimension here in the margin uh, base bound, there is a dimension on D, there is D log one over gamma, and in, in statistical learning, it is natural to, to ask for dimension independent bounds when one consider margin, but we have a lower bound for that. So if you, assume, if you allow a very large dimension, then there are points set with very large margin for which you need a lot of uh, queries. Okay, so um, for the, the next five minutes are going to be, I think, the only the, the, the only kind of technical discussion, but so please concentrate a bit uh, harder. And now I'm going to introduce this, uh, this combinatorial dimension I mentioned, uh, I, 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 I mentioned before, the 10, what was 10 for the plane. Okay, so what is the inference dimension? So it's again, it's some kind of combinatorial dimension. It's a number that is assigned to every class of functions. So for every class of function, you assign some number to it, and we call it the inference dimension. And this combinator, this inference dimension is essentially uh, captures uh, the query complexity of the class. So the, the I think the, the Nice thing about it, or what, what really helped us technically a lot, is that it reduces the analysis to just you know analyzing this combinatorial parameter. So now I give you a problem. You want I don't know. You want to I give you some class of function that I ask you what is the complexity of it. So you don't need to think about uh, an algorithm explicitly. You just need to analyze some very specific combinatorial dimension, and it may be hard to analyze it, but it's very very concrete and. Um, and uh, specific. And should I, ju just to make sure, this is query complexity in the comparison query model that you introduced. Yeah, comparison label pools. Yeah, so we will see soon the exact statements. And now, now before we go to the exact statement, let me just uh, note that this inference dimension extends to any type of local additional queries. So let's say now, instead of using comparison queries, you want to use three-wise comparisons or any other type of comparison that should be local in some sense, but most natural things are local, from my experience. Uh, I mean, in this context. So, you know, so a similar type of, of parameter will also capture uh, wait, wait. <clears throat> other type of queries. Sorry, so three-wise comparison, doesn't that immediately reduce to two-wise comparison? No, no, uh, uh, three-wise comparisons, yes, it, it reduces, I mean, if we take the definition, like in the example that I had with the babies, then it reduces to the two-wise comparison. But I'm saying, if you have now some kind of query that just depends on three input points, the answer to the query just depends on three input points, 
and you have a bunch of queries like this. So you can define an, an inference dimension for this type of queries. Soon it will be clear how, once you will see the definition. Okay. And for this, you, you have a similar uh, characterization. So basically, once you tell me, OK, I want to now design a, an active learning algorithm, and you know the way I can I can communicate with the annotator with the human annotator is I can ask him label queries and then I can ask him whatever some kind of you give me an additional type of queries that depend on the problems in some sense and the annotator then I can tell you okay so for this kind of queries that you specified there is this inference dimension and you just need to understand the inference dimension to understand the information complexity of your problem that's what I'm saying but for now let's Let's forget it, and let's just focus on comparisons. And later, maybe it will be clear. OK, so, um, so let me define the inference dimension. So remember that we have a class of functions h, and h is sine of g, where g is in some underlying class of field functions, capital F. And we are mostly interested when capital F is the set of, is the set of all linear functions. But this is a general definition. So the inference dimension of H of this class is the minimum number K such that for every sample of size K, there is some point in the sample. So there is some point. God knows this point. You don't know it, but God knows this point. God can remove this point from the sample. And then you ask all queries on the remaining k minus one points. And then God shows you this, this point back without telling you what the label is, but then you can infer the label. So for every realizable sample of size k, there, ex there exists at least one point whose label can be inferred from the queries on the other points. Let's see, we'll see two examples and I hope it will be clear afterwards. So the first example is about thresholds on the real line. I claim that the inference dimension of threshold is at most three. What do I need to prove to you? So I claim that, so what I need to show you is that for every three points, there is at least one point that I can remove and then query the points on the remaining two points and infer the label of this third point. So there are two cases. Either the hidden threshold labels all of the points, all of the three points positively. So God sees all of that. And then I can remove the middle point. And once I, and if you know the two labels of the extreme points and you know that both of them are plus, then the middle point must also be plus because if it was a minus, there would be two sign changes. And in each threshold, there is at most one sign change. So I repeat, if the three points all have the same labels, then the middle point, you can hide the label and still infer it, just from asking on the other points. The other direction is that not all three points have the same label. So two of them say are positive and one is negative. And then one of the endpoints can be inferred for the very same reason that there could be at most two sign changes. Okay, so again, the definition is what I needed to show to you in order to show that inference dimension is three, is that for every possibility of taking three points and labeling them with a function in the class, there is one point that can be removed and inferred. So, sorry, two quick questions. One mm -hmm. is here, um, you're just considering label queries. There's no comparisons. You're computing the inference dimension. Very so. good, very good point. Very good point, right? Uh, okay. And, and the other question is, is it, is it, um, so does this reduce to VC dimension when you have only uh, a label queries? So no. Inference... no, 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 no. It's okay. So because... let, let me answer both questions. Or let me at least. It's always uh... at least, no? Or, okay. No, no, no. So it's independent of the VC dimension. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so first, so the first question, well, uh, the first comment was that we only use label queries here. So the, in the inference process, we only use label queries. So what we actually just argued that only with label queries, even if we just restrict ourselves to label queries, the inference dimension of thresholds on the one dimensional line is three. And this 
is strongly related to the fact that we can learn all labels on the one dimensional case using just log n, you know, this binary search business that we did before. So this is a very good comment. And soon we'll see another example in the two dimensional case where we also need comparison queries for the inference. And then the second question was whether, um, what is the connection with the VC dimensions? So, um, so it's it's not connect. It's not they are not they are incomparable. So they are you can find classes whose uh, inference dimension is. Uh, you, I mean, you can cook up classes. They will not be very exciting, but you can cook, cook up examples where one is large and the other is uh, small, and vice versa. But even just for label queries, right? So even just for label. So for label queries, it's 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 really it corresponds to what is called the teaching dimension. The inference dimension level point, it's not completely trivial, but uh, one can prove it, that the teaching dimension is, in fact, um, um, yeah, a version of the teaching dimension, at least. It's, um, it's Haneke defined it. I forget the name he gave it. But, but yeah, but, um, but it's not the VC dimension in any case. OK. So let's see now another example that hopefully will help us digest the definition. So I claim now that the inference dimension of half planes is at most seven. So again, what do I need to show you? That given any seven points and any labeling uh, half plane, I can remove one point from there. There is a point that can be removed. God can remove a point from there. And later we can infer the label of this point just from querying on the remaining points. And the proof is very similar to the algorithm that we saw earlier. So if we have seven points, then there is at least four of them that have the same label, say plus, say red, just like the, the, in the picture here. And then, you know, using label queries, we can find the nearest point. And then we build this cone, and the point that is within the cone can be removed this uh, point that is circled by a green, uh, by a green uh, circle. This point can be removed. And this is exactly, notice it's the same logic that uh, we followed in the algorithm. OK? So the, 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 really, the point here is that any cone in the plane is, um, is determined by three points, can be is determined by three points. You take a cone that is spanned by some bunch of points, then there are three points that form a basis for, for this cone. This is basically the what it boils down to. OK, so this shows that the inference dimension is at most seven. It is, in fact, less than seven. It's only five. But uh, so, yeah. OK, so now let us. Um, so let me now state the, the general theorem. So if we have a class H, and the inference dimension is k. So we have an algorithm that uh, there is an algorithm that infer all labels, all n labels of any realizable sample with just k log k log n uh, queries. And the algorithm is very similar to what we saw before. What you do is in each iteration, you sample 2k of the remaining unlabeled points uniformly at random. You label all of their queries, and you sort. You basically sort uh, the, the positive points and the negative points according to their values using comparison queries. And then you just infer. And this is an abstract step. So now you have all this information just from the uh, queries on these 2k points that you sampled, and you just infer. So in any other points in the end points that you did not sample, you ask yourself whether I, whether the, the, its label is implied by the, by the queries we just did. And if it is, then you label it. And then you remove all inferred points, and you repeat the same iteration on the unlabeled points. And, and, and the lemma is that in each iteration, on expectation, you label half of the remaining points. And the proof is not, um, is not complicated, the proof of this part. Uh, but I will not uh, discuss it, of course. And there's also a lower bound. So um, if the inference dimension is larger than k, then there will be some samples for which you need more than k, uh, at least k um, 
uh, either a label or comparison queries. Okay, so this is, so basically whenever this uh, inference dimension is small, then something non-trivial can be done. And if it's large, then it's a lower bound. If it's infinite, for instance, then nothing non-trivial can be done. Um, okay, so um, that is about, the that. this is it about the first part. The second part is about showing uh, an application of this, of this methodology that we developed, of this uh, inference dimension, to, I don't know, complexity theory. Um, but first, let me ask if there are any questions about the first part. Anybody? Uh, yes, I have a question. Oh. Yes? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if it's possible to say more about the relationship between the inference dimension and the particular kinds of comparison queries that that are allowed. What do you mean by a particular kind of comparison queries? You just said that um, you define the inference dimension with respect to um, having some comparison queries, but you didn't say, I mean, in, in the examples, uh, I mean, for or for the half planes, you gave the example of, of just the uh, simple kind of comparison query, but the inference dimension says for a class of comparison queries, it's defined okay. comparison queries, but you didn't really say what they are. And I'm wondering okay. if. Okay. I, th I think they managed to, to confuse us. Um, so, okay, so the point is as follows Do you see the slides now? This is how the comparison queries are defined. You have a class of Boolean functions H which is just taking the sign of some other class of will functions H. We, when we, we only focused on the case where F is, where the class F of will functions is of linear functions, and then we get half spaces or half n functions. But comparison queries are defined uh, as, as they are here. So there is the, the unknown function G or sine of G, but there is this G that labels our, uh, our uh, points. And a comparison query is just asking the, the annotator whether G applied on this point is larger than or equal than G applied on that point. And when G is a linear function, in the case when G is a linear function, and let's say both G of XI and G of XJ are non-negative, then this comparison query is equivalent to asking which of the two points is closer to the half space, which form the zero set of G. Okay, that, 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 that's what we used in the plane. So G for a linear function or for an affine function uh, G, G of XI is larger than or equal than G of XJ, when both of them are non-negative, if and only if XI is closer, is far, further away than XJ from the zero set of G. And that's what I meant in the, in, in the geometric case that this comparison query, which is just, a, you just take the hidden function and you ask to which one it gives us a, a larger value. But in the case of half spaces, there is a natural geometric interpretation in terms of distances from the zero set. Does, does it clarify? Uh, But uh, I was asking about in the definition of inference dimension. In the in the definition of inference dimension, you mentioned uh, it includes. It, it says you know the label can be inferred from comparison and label queries, but you didn't say. I mean, you could imagine different having different kinds of comparison queries. Uh, okay, okay. So, so, okay, so, so what we formally defined is only with respect to the comparison queries uh, in the previous slide that we just discussed. Oh, okay. Oh, I so, see. So, so, this is what you can do. You can take the remaining k minus one points and you can ask for each pair of them, you know, is g of xi larger than g of xj? And you can ask what is the sign of g of xi for each, uh, for each point. 
Ah, and, okay. and from these particular queries, you need to be able to infer the, the hit, the point that was removed, the, the label of the point that was removed. And my, uh, because you mentioned more general comparison queries. Exactly, yeah. So I didn't give examples, but what I'm saying is that if you specify other type of queries, let's say just for instance, the three wise comparisons, then you can still uh, make the same definition. You can extend this definition to other queries. Yeah, you just need to be able to, we do need some locality of the type of queries in order for the theory to, de to, to, to extend, but the definition makes sense also if instead of two wise comparison queries, you also have three wise comparison queries. Or I don't know, you take all points and you look at the determinant of the, of, uh, you, you, I don't know, you take, you build a matrix and you take, look at the determinant, they take the sign or something. So you can think of other type of queries that one can, uh, that could potentially give you different dimensions. Then. And this will give you, a, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. That's what I was asking, yeah. Okay, okay, so uh, I hope. Um, yep, yep. Okay. okay, are there any other questions before we move to the, to the to part two, which is much shorter and we just, uh, it's a simple reduction. So are there any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, let's continue. So the second part um, is basically an application of the third part. So let me first uh, uh, define the problem of three sum. So in the three sum problem, we get as an input an array of n numbers x1 to xn, and one of the formulation of this problem is that we need to decide whether there is a triplet i j k such that x i plus x j plus x k equals zero. So there is a trivial algorithm that just goes over all pairs, all uh, triplets and checks whether they sum up to zero. This takes you roughly n cube time. Um, a nice exercise is to improve it to, uh, to n square algorithm using sorting somehow. And in 95, uh, uh, in a paper by Gadgetan and Overmars, they show that um, the free sum problem is in fact a bottleneck for many, many other uh, problems. Their context was discrete geometry in the sense that if you can improve the quadratic time algorithm for free sum, then you will also get an improvement for this bunch of other uh, problems that uh, are studied in discrete geometry. And um, and they, based on this on, on this uh, hardness of of, of three sum, the fact that it's a complete problem for a large class of uh, of, of problems, they also conjecture that uh, you know this quadratic uh, uh, time algorithm cannot be substantially improved. And um, yes, and uh, okay, so. Yeah, so one example of a problem that uh, threesome is a bottleneck for is you're given n lies in the plane and you need to decide whether they are in general position. And for, so for this problem, the best known algorithm is quadratic and threesome hardness will also imply it's, it's optimal. So it seems like a pretty central problem for, a, uh, for many other interesting uh, problems. And uh, also uh, more recently, there were other connections uh, uh, in the context of fine-grained complexity. Um, now, one uh, avenue of, uh, you know, at least convincing ourselves that threesome is hard, or, or three the threesome conjecture is true, is maybe to try to derive lower bounds in simpler models of computation. So for example, let's go back to sorting algorithms. So if you ask a random, uh, CS graduate, and you'll ask them what, what is the complexity of, uh, of sorting, and they, they will tell you n log n, and then you will ask them why, then they will tell you, okay, there is this information theoretic lower bound of log of n factorial, and we also have merge sort that uh, reaches this lower bound in, in terms of an upper bound. So, uh, although it's, you know, formally this statement is incorrect, because in the Turing model we don't have a, an n log n lower bound for sorting, and it's even not not precisely, not even true in some, in, uh, at least in some cases. So, but still, I mean, um, if we have a class of algorithms that 
that, uh, that solve sorting using comparisons, and we can show that you that, that, that uh, using comparisons you cannot do better. Then it's some form of explanation of evidence for the complexity of this problem. So a similar avenue was taken in the context of uh, of three sum, and there they noticed that that many uh, the basic algorithms they use certain kind of queries. So what kind of queries do they use? They basically, in each step, you can take a linear combination of your uh, input array, and you ask whether it's equal zero, it's larger than zero, or it's smaller than zero. So for example, in the, the basic simple algorithm that just goes over all triplets is of this kind, right? You go for every triplet, you ask whether xi plus xj plus xk is zero, larger than zero, or smaller than zero. This algorithm is in this model, but also the other, the more uh, sophisticated algorithm is also of this type. So, so the question is really, so we have now a linear decision tree. What is a linear decision tree? It's a decision tree where every node is, is labeled by a query of this type. And there is a, it's a, it's a, the out, the out degree of each node is three. There is either equal zero, smaller than zero, or greater than zero. And the depth is the maximum number of queries. And we also look at the sparsity of a query, which is the number of variables with non-zero coefficients in the, in the query. Okay, and the question is, okay, so maybe we can prove that any linear decision tree for three sum must have depth at least n squared. This will correspond to the fact that, this is anal anal analogous to the fact that any comparison-based algorithm for sorting requires n log n comparisons. It's of depth at least n log n. Okay. So, so actually in 2014, uh, this conjecture was refuted by Grondund and Petty, and they devised an, uh, an algorithm in this context, in this, uh, this linear decision tree, that does only n to the three half many queries, for which much, much less than n squared. And, um, and in terms of lower bounds, uh, there, is a, there are two papers, the one by, uh, by Elon and Chazel and one by uh, Ericsson, and they show that if the queries are very sparse, or only three sparse, so you can only take a, a combination of three variables, then you cannot do better than n squared. Okay, and what we show in this work is that um, there is an LDT for three sum of depth roughly n log n, n log square n, and the only queries it uses are these label queries. So you pick a triplet that you ask, is it zero, is it larger than zero, is it smaller than zero, or comparison queries. So you take two triplets and compare their sums. So these are in terms of so I wouldn't even call it a linear decision tree. For me, it's just a comparison decision tree. But if you insist to look on it as a linear decision tree, then it is six sparse, right? The sparsity of each query is at most six. So it's a very simple kind of linear decision tree. And I personally prefer to look at it as a comparison decision tree. So you can see that just with comparisons, you can basically achieve the information theoretical barrier of n log n up to a log factor. Wait, sorry, I got completely confused. Um, why is that not a n log squared n algorithm? So, because um, okay, that's a good question. Because so then not so first I understand, but so for every n, you give me n as an input, and then I can take my time and I build this. Oh, it's non-uniform okay. decision tree, and maybe building this decision tree will take me n cube or n to the fourth, and and it will actually probably something like that. But then I build it, and then you know once. Uh, so you can think of it also in an amortized sense, right? If you give me, if you tell me, look, shy for the next thousand years, you're going to solve three sum on n equals one billion, and tell you, okay, let me work a little bit and spend one year maybe, and then I'll build this decision tree, and then in an amortized sense, it'll be very, very efficient. And actually, this is also interesting whether you can incorporate these things in a data structure and do it in. A, but yeah, but okay, but is it clear there? Yeah. But, uh, so, how does your uh, upper bound does not contradict the Allen Chazelle uh, lower bound of n square for higher sparsity since you've got sparsity six? Because uh, there's the, the lower bounds for higher sparsities for four and five, uh, it it goes very, it, it's it's very very it decays very fast as you go from k to two k. 
Oh, okay. It doesn't contradict it, and the reason is that the lower bound is very is very weak once you reach 2K. It's actually undefined for 2K. So we get 2K, right? Yeah, so another another remark is that you can also use the same algorithm for k sum, and you get n times k times log square n for k sum. Okay, so now let me before I will discuss some interesting problems, open problems. Let me just explain you what is the connection between this and this inference business. So the idea is very simple. So remember that in the inference dimension business we have these endpoints in R D, and we want to to query all their labels, to, to reveal all their labels. And we, we get to ask these comparison queries and label queries. So here, assume that the unlabeled points are all points on the n-dimensional cube with exactly three ones. And think of, of the input array as the normal to the hyperplane, to the half space that labels these points. So we have, a, we have this x1 to xn, and basically the function g is inner product, is, is the inner product with x1 to, to xn. So, so as you can see, the, the, at a, a point p with Hamingway 3 is labeled positive, even only if the sum of the three corresponding uh, entries is positive. It's labeled negative, if and only if the sum of the three corresponding entries is negative, and it's labeled zero if and only if the sum is zero. So our goal, the three sum problem, is basically check whether among these n choose three unlabeled points, there is one point whose label is zero. So what we will show is something stronger. We will show that with just n log square n queries, not only can we decide whether there is a triplet whose sum is zero, but for every triplet, we will classify whether its sum is positive, negative, or zero. And this is exactly the, 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 the active learning problem for half spaces with comparison queries. The unlabeled points are all triplets of Hamingway 3. And the input array defines the function, the target function that labels it. OK? And then, basically, what we show is that the inference dimension of these guys, of this set of points, is only n. And, and from this, we already get this randomized uh, algorithm, like before. You query two endpoints in each iteration at random. You label them, and you, you, know, you label all triplets, whether they are positive, they're negative, or zero. You compare all the positive triplets, and you sort all the positive triplets and all the negative triplets, and then you infer. And you proceed in this manner. You can also de-randomize this algorithm. It, it requires some uh, non-trivial technical effort, but it's fairly standard. It's not uh, very exciting. Um, OK. So, so is the reduction clear, how these two these two problems are related, this uh, um, active learning of house spaces and linear decision trees, or comparison decision trees, actually. OK, so, um, so let me give you some more applications just that follows exactly the same reductions. So let's assume you have two subsets of, of uh, or two arrays of, of uh, size n of real numbers. And your goal is to sort a plus b. So all, what is A plus B? is all pairs, A plus B, where A is in capital A and B is in capital B. So we also give an LDT that does it in just n log square n time, queries, I mean. So notice that number of pairs can be quadratic, and this is only linear in n. So it's square root size of, of the output. And the only queries that it uses is uh, whether, you know, comp the comparison queries, a1 plus B1 is greater than or equal than A2 plus B2, or difference comparison queries. So is this pair larger than that pair? Is the first pair larger than the second pair? More than the third pair is larger than the fourth pair. So only with this kind of access, you can very efficiently uh, find the, the order type of, the, of A plus B. 
another, uh, uh, I think, you know, a toy application that, um, yeah, it's not in the paper, but it's something I prepared for the talk. So let P be some unknown polynomial of degree at most D over the real line, a univariate polynomial. So P defines an ordering when the number is 1 to N, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to N. Yeah, so what is the ordering P defines? So I is less than J. If P of I, the value P gives to I, is less than P of J, the value that P gives to J. Yeah, so every polynomial defines some ordering. So is it true that we can sort this ordering, we can find these orderings? Are these simpler when these small? This is the, the goal, yeah, to, 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 if the dimension of the, if the degree of the, a polynomial is small to understand this ordering better. So again, yes, we show that you can basically sort it using just d square log square n queries. Yeah, so if this is constant, you just do polylogarithmic number of queries and you sort n points and you just use the fact that the degree of the, of the polynomial that defines the ordering is small. And again, we use comparisons or difference comparisons just like before. And again, one of the one of the disadvantages of, of this whole uh, framework that we suggest is that it's non-uniform. So we can show that information theoretically, it is very you can sort very fast such such uh, such orders. But can it also be done in a uniform way? And this I think is a, is a nice open question. So so take the same setting. We have some unknown polynomial of degree at most d, and we want to find something about the ordering. Let's say what is the median or I don't know, any other, uh, can, can we do it fast? Can we do it in sublinear time? Um, okay, so let me summarize and then uh, take some more questions. So the, we had two parts for this talk. First, we discussed uh, uh, active learning and we showed that if we allow the learner, learning algorithm to also use comparison queries, then from an information theoretical perspective, it becomes much stronger and it uh, overcomes many of the bottlenecks of, of uh, classical active learning. And from a technical perspective, we develop this inference I mentioned, which captures the query complexity. And then we use this machinery to devise uh, nearly optimal uh, comparison trees for a bunch of uh, combinatorial or, 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 combinator, uh, or geometrical problems. And um, in terms of uh, future research, then yeah, one obvious uh, uh, direction is to consider other type of additional queries, maybe uh, that are used in practice in some application, uh, maybe other type of relative queries. I mean, there is a, uh, yeah, there are many possibilities in this direction. Uh, also, you can consider a streaming version of this uh, question. So now, now you don't get to see all the unlabeled points together, but you get them one by one and you only can remember six of them or whatever, like uh, so a streaming model. Uh, maybe noisy versions, agnostic learning. So the, no, not, not, So if you think of crowdsourcing, which is a a very typical scenario in which people use such relative queries. So maybe some, maybe some of the comparisons will be noisy. Uh, uniform algorithms. Ah, yeah. So I wanted to. Do, so an, another another uh, curious fact is that um, this decision trees that we build, let's say for three sum, actually give you a short certificate. for uh, an array to not to be a no instance of three sum. So, yeah, so, so think now on three sum from an NP coin P perspective. So if the array contains a triplet that sums to zero, it's very easy to, to prove it, right? I'll just show you this triplet and then you verify. It's, there's a very, there is, but can I conv convince you fast? Let's say that the, the array contains no triplet that sums to zero. Is there a short proof? Is there a short certificate for this fact? So right, so our, it seems that our decision tree, this comparison decision tree, if you just follow the path that corresponds to this no instance, then you get a very short proof of that. But verifying this proof 
uh, actually takes you time, at least in the naive way. So I think it is interesting to, to understand the non-deterministic or the co-non-deterministic complexity of, uh, of free sum. Is it sub-quadratic? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, and I mentioned the uh, yeah, sorting A plus B, sorting polynomially induced orders. I think all of these questions uh, make uh, sense in the uniform uh, model, and uh, it's uh, interesting to study them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Shai. Uh, so we can take questions. Maybe let me ask about these other types of additional queries thing. So because I I had this question earlier that said, well, okay, what if you reveal the value of the function? And so you convinced me that that was too much. Uh, and so comparison queries are s sort of somewhere at the bottom. And in, in situations where um, you have a real valued function that you are, you know, there's some underlying real valued function, but then the labels are given by the sign of the function. So you're sort of truncating the, so if, but in, in other learning models, so if you, if what you're trying to learn is actually a Boolean function, for example, is there any such um, extension of the query model that can be done? Like say you're just learning DNFs or something. So that there's no, um, um, you know, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's, it's just a Boolean function and then. Um, so you're asking if, if there is some natural. Oh, I'm, I'm asking uh, if there's a meaningful extension of the model to other uh, learning scenarios where the function that you're trying to learn, the class of functions is just like a straight class of Boolean functions instead of here, the class of functions that you considered, they're Boolean functions that are obtained from a real valued function, right? And so there's a natural way to extend. Um, yes, so, so yeah, so um, I, I, I didn't think about it. I don't know, I don't have a, so I mostly work with such classes that are basically signs of real functions. But uh, yeah, for DNF, it's an interesting question, like whether for DNF there is some type of additional query that makes sense and um, and can actually at least yeah accelerate the the learning process, the sample complexity. Yeah, so now it's, I guess like you have you would have a hidden DNF, the secret DNF, and you get some examples, and you can get the labels. Okay, that's the standard thing, and the question is. Is there a meaningful way to? Yeah, so it's not clear what else it might be helpful yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah, but but it could. I mean, it's not clear also that not. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, I would have to think about it, but in general, I think that uh, in this active learning uh, setting, I mean, there are plenty of works, and in practice, they use plenty of additional queries. And I'm really not an expert on practical work in active learning, but uh, but. But I'm sure there are, I mean, I know that there are plenty of other type of queries that people use, and maybe it will also be interesting to consider them from a theoretical perspective and to formalize them in this context. I had another very small question, which is just that this parameter inference I mentioned, so is it, um, I mean, it's not going to be easy to compute. Is it even, um, is it, can you say anything about the, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's even obviously in NP, for example. Yeah, so it's also, I guess in order to, to formally define a computational problem, it's also, yeah, okay, so. Well, deciding whether inference dimension is at least. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, usually we work with infinite, like with class of all linear functions from R D to R. So it's the question is how you represent. So, so if you just get, let, uh -huh. let's say, I mean, it's, there's a question of representation here or the function class, but um, I think that all already the inference dimension for just for label queries. So you know, without comparisons, is already. I believe I don't want to commit, but I, if I remember correctly, then it's already hard in this context when you, let's say you get all the truth table of the fun of all your class then even then it's uh, it's hard yes i believe it should be hard it's like hitting set or something um 
So I think it's, it's computationally hard to decide what the inference dimension is, small or large. Just like you know, other parameters, VC dimension, or all my, yeah. most of parameters that pop up in learning are, uh, are like that. We have other questions. Anyone want to ask a question? If there's no more questions, I think I'll take us offline. So uh, thanks, uh, Shai, for the talk. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, I remind you that a couple of weeks from now, it'll be uh, Danuban Nanonkai uh, telling us about uh, distributed shoulder spot a um, couple of weeks from now. OK, uh, so thanks. Bye-bye. Um, so Shai, I'll take us offline, but uh, you can stay for a minute if, you, if you'd like, or anyone can stay for a minute.